The Imperfect Messenger Ron Paul stutters. Sometimes, while speaking out loud, he makes statements that are potentially confusing to his listeners, although which make perfect grammatic sense if read written down. Once Comedy Central Daily Show news anchor John Stewart referred to Ron Paul as a bit of a pen and paper guy, referring to Ron's tendency to get carried away while speaking extemporaneously and then still be able to bring his point back around to the initial premise, even after a long interjection of additional information, using simple topical points at pivotal moments in his speech. A lot of Ron Paul's unique delivery in speaking is due to his own interior struggle to maintain his level of personal confidence in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds against him. As I mentioned before, when I met him, I instantly connected to Ron Paul's shyness, which is so obvious to me as someone who is also shy. He has long struggled to overcome his humble nature and to become a stronger public speaker. It is this humility in his delivery that has opened the door for his detractors to accuse him of being like a leprechaun and to make humor of his personality, or worse, allowed them to gloss over, marginalize, and ignore him altogether. What his supporters believe. Doug Weed, a chief staffer in the Restore America Now 2012 Ron Paul presidential campaign, once referred to Ron Paul as a Gandhi-like creature. This is indeed how this spry yet slender 77-year-old great-grandfather appears to his Paulite supporters. His irreproachable adherence to his beliefs Incorruptible in the face of offers of money, fame, power, and coupled with threats of death and torture, defamation, and death threats against those he loves, has earned him among his supporters a deeper level of adherence and strength of hope than any politician since J.F. Kennedy. That he chose the Republican Party to base his platform of libertarian ideals within is only, he often admits, to win elections because it is impossible to do so if you are in a third party outside the strict two-party system. And he speaks from experience, having lost as the third party libertarian candidate in 1988. However, as it is quite clear in this case, oftentimes the politician's affiliation to a political party means less to their constituents than do the personal beliefs of that politician themselves. Ron Paul not only decries the status quo establishment, he has proposed an alternative to it that would be preferable to anyone else who is also disenchanted with the existing system. During the earlier months of the 2012 election cycle, Ron repeatedly met MSM challenges to his credibility, based on his age and health, by saying he would challenge any of the other candidates to a 10-mile bike ride in 100% humidity in Texas. In short, the only complaint anyone who has heard Ron Paul's message can level against Ron Paul himself is that he is too good to be true. This sort of cynical skepticism threatens us with the end of the American middle class. What his detractors believe. Ron Paul's detractors believe they can use him as bait to lure out the opinions of all their potential political enemies and then round them up and put them into concentration camps. They, and I must specify, comprise an incredibly numerically small group of people. However, they are both serious about that threat and capable financially of carrying it out. In short, the small cabal wish to think of Ron Paul as controlled opposition, regardless of whether they are letting him in on their use of him as such or not. To this extent, they find him useful and allow him to go on about his daily business, unaware they are purposefully letting him live for their own nefarious reasons. His detractors, both those who plot his downfall as well as those who simply see no future for him, consider him as appealing only to a fringe of socially marginalized losers, the hippie types that President Nixon had once dubbed radical muckraking liberals. This, of course, is simply not the truth. 
the liberty message is not going away. And the more Ron Paul's predictions of the decay of American values the New World Order incrementally imposes on the American people, the more angry everyone gets. Ultimately, the populists do not blame the messenger. And only, as I say, a very small number of very rich people on this planet right now are even thinking how to exploit or exterminate him to their own benefit. Ron Paul's detractors, for the most part, are elitists. They look down their noses at other people and ultimately trust nobody. What they believe about Ron Paul is the same as they believe about his supporters and the same they believe about everyone. They are stupid, worthless wastes of resources, and they deserve to die. You see, for as much good as there is expressed in the liberty message of Ron Paul, there is at least as much evil bottled up inside the hearts and minds of the rich elite in the New World Order. The New World Order It may or may not seem hard to believe that there are people so sour in their own guts, so self-loathing, and so self-absorbed in their minds, that they have come to the conclusion they are the smartest person on earth, that the world revolves entirely around them, and that everyone else alive now deserves to die when a comet crashes into the earth. Nevertheless, there are people alive right now, so sour in their own guts, so self-loathing bodily and so self-absorbed mentally, that they had it etched into the Georgia Guidestones in five languages that the total human population on Earth needs to be reduced to around 100 million. Present estimates exceed 7 billion alive now. Tuxedo philanthropist Ted Turner has advocated this publicly, while billionaire Bill Gates has made substantial financial contributions to the World Health Organization, WHO, to sterilize women and to spread incurable infections in third world countries, mainly in Africa. It is no secret that even Apple Macintosh founder Steve Jobs benefited from stem cell surgery performed on him in China, where stem cells are inhumanely procured through forced abortion. The essential eugenics agenda of the richest elite alive now is not new, nor was it when Hitler wrote of it as the Aryan ideal of racial hygiene, later called ethnic cleansing, i.e. genocide, in Mein Kampf during the Weimar Republic era of hyperinflation in Germany. The concept of purging the undesirables can be traced back to no sooner than the earliest Caesars of the Roman Empire. Prior to this time, prisoners of war were captured and made into slaves or killed. However, following the massive expansion of territories under the later Roman Republic, the earliest Caesars were, ubiquitously, driven totally power-mad. They invented the concept of an enemy of the state, who could also be a citizen of the state and who, once labeled as such a terrorist, could be subject to random assassination. Ultimately, it doesn't matter whether you are being targeted for assassination due to your race, be it Semitic, Palestinian, or Black African, or due to your creed of beliefs, be it Muslim or Yiddish. The height of this hateful ideology is simply put, population reduction. If you believe the planet Earth is overpopulated with human beings, take the initiative and kill yourself. Nevertheless, the false premise of overpopulation causing pollution that contributes to global warming is an alarmist battle cry among the environmentalist scientists who benefit from government funding grants. Who are the New World Order? You are not in the New World Order if you are reading this. In point of factual process, if you are even aware that the New World Order exists, you are not in the New World Order. The New World Order does not call itself that, and the members of the most financially elite planning bodies do not call themselves nor their philosophy by that term. Oftentimes, the equally insulting slang nomen 
Illuminati is slung at these hyper-rich scum pigs. However, this is no less inappropriate than calling Obama my nigga, or my homie, if you're not George Bush, King Fod, or the Pope. It would probably come as only a small shock for any current presidential candidate who, once elected, would find out that they are in fact utterly powerless to disobey their real bosses in the New World Order. Romney is nothing if not a poster child for a New World Order wannabe, and Santorum, Bachman, Kane, and Gingrich are the same. Gingrich can at least say he attended Bohemian Grove, although in interviews he denies it even exists, saying instead only, some people have a very vivid imagination. When asked about it by independent journalist for We Are Change, Luke Rodowski. The people who are in the positions of the greatest authority over making policy choices for the movements of armies, the impositions of economic sanctions, the rerouting of food and energy supplies, etc., are a small cabal, truly speaking a conspiracy, who are simply super rich and who mostly all know one another. They don't see themselves as bad people. They just see you and I and everyone else below their economic class as bad people. The fact of this is never so apparent as when a rich elitist is questioned about a crime for which they are complicit in commanding the order for. They run away, hide their face from the camera, and often insult or assault the journalist. They are completely consumed by their own self-loathing. To such an extent, they insulate themselves entirely from all possible recrimination for their immoral choices. To say they are psychotic would not be exactly accurate. Technically, they could be diagnosed as sociopathic schizophrenics, because, like sociopaths or malignant narcissists, they understand, yet ignore, the moral register of right and wrong, and because, like schizophrenics, they exist entirely insulated inside a realm of their own delusions, with no contact to any outside world. The apparent difference in social status between a full-fledged criminal pimp, like Charles Manson, and a full-fledged legal pimp, like Dominique Strauss-Kahn, is negligible in historical hindsight. There is no doubt now, 2,000 years later, that Caesar Nero was himself the greatest enemy of the state of his era. One hundred years from now, the fact that Bush knocked down the towers will be taught in elementary schools. As they say, you should choose to be on the right side of history. The old guard of the richest elites, the so-called 1% of the 1%, consist of a very small number of people alive right now, and they don't subscribe to any group hierarchy but see each other as more or less equal in defending their wealth against the crisis of democracy. They are all completely psychotic and, in my personal opinion at least, should probably just be shot.